And I want to thank um, uh, uh, Fred Gordon and others, including you, who created an excellent paper on inefficiencies in digital advertising. So what I want to do is share a little bit of, of my observations. Uh, I want to start by saying I completely agree with your last point, which is one of the th most important things that advertisers and marketers can do is experiment, experiment, experiment to be able to learn. I think the more we do that, the more we can absolutely um, make a big difference. So, um, you know, I'll start with, with um, John Wanamaker's quote, uh, which, um, which uh, was, was half my advertising is wasted. The trouble is I don't know which half. And at the time he did this over a century ago, newspaper advertising was the dominant form of media for marketers. And that over time gave way to radio uh, and TV. And so when the digital media revolution began in the 1990s, uh, we marketers had high hopes that digital media was going to solve this persistent problem of waste that's plagued the industry since the advent of mass marketing. Um, so now, though, with digital being the dominant form of media, it's now $300 billion in spending, surpassing television, substantial waste still exists. Uh, in fact, as, as digital media grew, the industry faced the inconvenient truth that it was operating in a fairly non-transparent, murky, and sometimes even fraudulent digital media supply chain. So, Matt, if you go to slide two, I'm sorry to say that 100 years later, Wanamaker's quote is still relevant. Uh, marketers and industry associations have taken many steps to clean up the supply chain through a lot of different initiatives, but much more still needs to be done. And now... I'm afraid we believe that half of our digital marketing is wasted, and the trouble is we still don't know which half. We do, however, have some more insight uh, into some sources of inefficiencies and waste and some possible solutions, which I'll just briefly touch on here, and then we'll open it up for questions. So if you move to slide three, I'll just summarize here the, the, the core uh, sources of inefficiencies and, and, and talk about them just a bit. Let's start with viewability. Now, viewability means simply the opportunity to see an ad. Did the ad make it onto the screen or, or wherever that would be that a human can see it? And what we, what we found we needed was a common standard for assessing the degree of viewability because that is important to conduct business transparently and comparatively across platforms. If you think about TV, Nielsen ratings are the way in which we can, we can at least assess um, some form of, of comparability. And, um, but, but what we found in the digital world is that um, every platform was creating its own viewability metric, uh, which they used to set payment terms for advertising. So Facebook, for example, considered an ad viewable and therefore billable as soon as one pixel entered the screen, while YouTube, the whole ad needed to be shown. So not having this standard actually led us to wasting a lot of time trying to figure out and explain the differences. So in response, the Media Ratings Council, or MRC, proposed a common standard for ads, which was actually a very, very low standard in that you know, an ad display or a banner ad was considered viewable when 50% of the pixels were on the user screen for a half a second. And videos were considered viewable when 50% of the video was on a user screen for two seconds. So Look, not perfect, but at least we had some standard that allowed us to be able to measure. And so what we did, along with the rest of the industry, is set an expectation that, that everyone adopt these standards, uh, agencies, media suppliers, platforms alike, and then that it be measured and then measured by a third party and accredited by the MRC through audits. And so eventually platforms and publishers developed a system to comply with this. Here's the problem. Once we had this standard, we then found substantial waste. We actually found that the average view time for digital banner ads was about 1.7 seconds, so a little more than a glance. And what we realized, we were spending way too much money on static digital display ads, which consumers were literally just skipping past with little to no engagement. So we shifted spending into more effective media video, for example, television, believe it or not, we actually shifted money back into TV, um, and, uh, and say in also radio and some, some other forms, which were, were uh, traditional, but we, we found could be 
more effective. So um, even though we don't debate standards anymore, we still see that there's a lot of waste on viewability. And so um, we we believe what 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 uh, marketers can do is 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 really demand that you get viewability and also um, get it measured and accredited, and then you can make your own assessment. And what it's not, what we're finding now is we're now trying to find and focus more on engagement. Find find more places where people don't just view an ad, but where they actually engage. Second, uh, reach and frequency. You know, for media to be efficient, ads need to reach the intended audience at some frequency. Uh, our research on our products, which are everyday health hygiene and cleaning products that you're all familiar with, Pampers, Loves, Campax Always, Charmin Bounty, Tide, Crest, Gillette, Head & Shoulders, Venus, Crest, Oral-B, um, we found that you, an ad needs to be viewed at least once a week to register awareness, and generally three times a week to be able to move people from awareness to actually registering and then leading to purpose, to purchase, sorry. Um, but, and more than that, it, it generally is, is considered wasteful. And it does depend on the, on the, on the medium because there is different levels of, of, of assessment and engagement on each of these. So what we were finding is that there was not commonplace measurement and we were relying on self-reporting from digital platforms and publishers, which essentially is equivalent of the fox guarding the hen house. So what we called for is, again, third party, Media Ratings Council accredited measurement verification of audience reach and frequency for all digital play, digital players. And so after some resistance, and by the way, there was some initial resistance because the platforms weren't set up to do this, they moved into these systems and now they're conducting audits and accreditation to verify that we get what we pay for. Um, again, we found substantial waste. Uh, and, and primarily the substantial waste was from the same ad being served to the same person multiple times. And so it's duplication or excess frequency that goes to consumers over and over and over again, not three times, but sometimes seven times, sometimes 20 times. And what that does is just waste money and annoy consumers. And so um, what we have been focusing on doing then is is trying to establish at least some clear reach and frequency targets so we don't waste this money and don't uh, have excess frequency at least within those that we can measure now um, and that's what i would uh, uh would, would really uh, ask all marketers to be thinking about is make sure you have third-party mrc accredited measurement of your reach and frequency and set targets so you can eliminate reduction. I will come uh, reduce waste. That is, I'll come back to the across platforms in a moment. The third, and and um, um, both Ken uh, and Rosie and others have talked about this, is ad fraud. That's when ad, ads are served not to consumers but to what is referred to as invalid traffic, which are called bots, which I guess is short for robots that mimic human online activity. And then where the fraudulent sites from which those those bots are are on and engaging with, the payment goes to criminals. So there's been estimates of as high as 20% of digital media spending uh, would be ad fraud. Um, so the the one of the problems is that the providers are responsible for detecting this traffic and then either eliminate or reimburse advertisers for fraudulent activity. Um, what we called for is third-party audits of that uh, of of those those assessments to ensure that it was being properly handled. And there are many publishers who are doing this, but some of the most dominant digital players, which uh, are are called the Wall Gardens, do not because they do first-party audits because they're um, concerned about somehow exposing uh, private data. And so they cite privacy reasons for this. So um, at this point, we don't have third-party assessment of invalid traffic, but we have, uh, or, or fraud, but we do have first-party, which it's reported as being low, but we can't exactly be sure until we get some kind of a third party. So we're continuing to call for third-party uh, auditing, and we think all marketers should do the same. Um, and, and until we get that, we can't really be sure whether that we're not seeing this kind of fraud. 
Um, the the next place I would call out in terms of where waste and inefficiency is lack of transparency in general, which I was just speaking about. Um, and, uh, and Ken, you talked about information asymmetry, which is exactly the case. In fact, I uh, have discovered over time that information asymmetry exists in a large part throughout the entire media industry. In fact, it was a an agency uh, leader who once talked to me about how why the reason why we should hire his firm is because they have achieved information asymmetry and that they have basically his point was um, our capabilities means that we have more information than the uh, the media providers that we're um, that we're negotiating with. So therefore, we have uh, an advantage, and that concerned me because I thought, well, if you have more information than the providers, then you have more information than us too. So that puts us at a disadvantage. You look at at digital media; there is a huge amount of information asymmetry. Um, largely, again, the wall gardens control audience data about billions of people, and they don't share. And there's reasons why they don't share that data for privacy reasons. However, we would just like to have at least some signal that. We're not reaching the same person over and over and over again. And, and every time I've had a debate with those, the, the guard, the, the, these companies about that, they said, well, there's privacy problems. I said, look, I want privacy compliance is absolutely correct, but I want you to figure out how you can solve the problem. If you can create a self-driving car, certainly you can help us figure out how we don't reach the same person over and over and over again. Uh, and this is something that all marketers have called uh, called upon because if you think about the problem, the problem is if I'm reaching a person with an ad uh, with on Tide on Facebook, and the same person on YouTube, and the same person on Twitter, and the same person on Snap, and and then another several other publishers, including TV, it's a lot of frequency that is wasting money and annoying consumers. So what we're trying to develop is a cross-platform solution so we can get some kind of a objective signal that um, that is privacy compliant, of course, so we can have a level playing field and reduce the, the level of excess that occurs. Now, even when that uh, occurs, um, it's still going to be difficult for marketers to have a, le a level playing field because of the significant data that the providers have and the amount of the billions that they have. So what that is leading to is more and more of us moving toward gathering our own first party data, privacy compliant, of course, but also moving into more programmatic spending, which is automated spending that allows us to be able to get into ad exchanges that allow us to be able to compare across multiple publishers. And so we now have a significant amount of our money being shifted into this programmatic um, medium so we can, we can have a little bit more, a lot more control over where our ads go. The final source of waste that I would call out is harmful content, and both Rosie and Pam talked about this in in depth, and so I won't go into it in detail. You're very clear what the issue is, and I'll come at it from the standpoint of it's a waste because the human mind pays attention to things that are provocative, and when there is uh, content that is either harmful in some form, whether it be violence, terrorism, nudity, pornography, hate speech, or anything that's denigrating or discriminatory, the human mind pays more attention to that than any ad that would be next to it. Um, so that's, that's the best case scenario. The worst case scenario is that if that ad is next to that kind of content, people lose trust in that brand because they associate that brand with promoting that harmful content. So this is why we, we uh, and, and then the third point is, it's just the right thing to do to not have harmful content um, uh, and, and have any, any brands associated with that. Now, as, as Pam mentioned, there are some standards being put in place by the Global Alliance for Responsible Media, but enforcement is challenging again. And we need common metrics. We need to make sure that we have transparency as to how much hateful or harmful content exists. We really want to be able to have third-party audits to objectively verify results, and we want to make sure that we have uh, alternatives to enable us to be able to put our advertising in places that don't have such content. We do not want our brands to be associated with that such content, and we also don't want um, it to be funding such content. So 
what what we would uh, advise and, and and ask others is is get involved in GARM, get involved in the the Engage Responsibly program that that Pam just uh, discussed, and then let's make sure that we can put in place some forms of allowing us to be able to eliminate this content, but also provide transparent reporting and alternatives for ad placement. At the end of the day, we support freedom of expression, but we believe that it's the responsibility of the platforms to eliminate things that are obviously harmful or hateful. And at minimum, we want to make sure our ads don't show up there. So uh, to summarize, John Wanamaker's quote is still valid today, more than a century later. The difference is I think now we have a greater understanding of where the sources for waste are and the potential solutions for eliminating it through advancements in viewability, third-party measurement, uh, reach and frequency, anti-fraud actions, cross-platform transparency, and eliminating harmful content. Um, and we would just um, continue to move forward. And, and really, all of us, marketers, agencies, platforms, and providers need to come together to address these inefficiencies, because what we'd like to see is ultimately a, a level playing field, full transparency that, that allows us to eliminate uh, waste, reach people when, where, and how they want to be reached in a safe environment, and do so in such a way that will get the most effective experience, uh, most the best experience for consumers, and the most effective experience for for marketers and all involved to create growth and value. So that's my view, and now I'd li love to open it up for questions. So I have a, uh, a vignette, a comment, and a question. The vignette is uh, directed to Ken because um, he showed hang gliding as a, an example of a credence good, which I found hysterical. I'm especially noting that Ken has jumped out of a plane with a parachute. Um, the other remark there is I note he did it the week before he was teaching, not the week after. And I'll let you take your own inferences from that. The comment, um, is it's really provocative, again, I know I've used that word a lot today, but especially in this case, to hear what Mark and Ken have talked about, because there's a huge disconnect, and I've been studying advertising all my life, between the research we're doing and the issues that Ken um, and, and Mark have laid out. And obviously, these are topical issues on the minds of people doing advertising. So it begs the question, why aren't we, why aren't we looking into them more? Um, comment, another comment quickly, please type questions. Uh, my question, um, concerns the video ecosystem. So this is both for Mark and, and Ken. You know, you've been predominantly talking about display, but as you well know, you know, the old world of Nielsen validation and measurement disappearing because people are migrating from linear to OTT, and even linear is switching to ATSC 3.0. There's more walled gardens and exchanges. Uh, media buys are becoming very hard measurement. It just seems like it's turning into a mess. And I'm wondering how you're thinking about how inefficiencies are evolving and some, some new and interesting issues in the context of video. One thing I would say is in video, what we're seeing is um, there is a, 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 a trend toward over the top streaming and, uh, and other types of platforms. That, so a, a migration from linear to digital. So in my view, um, it won't be long before we are now looking at everything being digital um, and everything being, so the, the, the word of digital media will go away in that because it will just be all media can be fueled by data and, um, uh, and, and digital technology. What we're focusing on is trying to ensure that those new platforms don't, don't give way to the same inefficiencies <laughs> So, uh, frankly, we'd like to see those platforms move into programmatic, so we can get a uh, get a get an assessment across the multiple video options to enable us to be able to make the right placements. There will still also be a place for what we call private marketplace deals. In other words, the ability to have a a decide I'm going to go ahead and spend X amount of money on Peacock. And, and then what Peacock can do is then decide what's the most efficient way of doing things. That's okay, as long as we can agree up front. And then ultimately, I'd like to see if we can do that across, across the platforms. 
that's where we need to be in my view. I think if we do that, we actually can raise all boats. We can then compete on the basis of the quality of content and the quality of video of, of advertising versus what is now competing on the basis of information asymmetry. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's an interesting perspective. And um, you know, when when you think about video, uh, the the first thing uh, I do is, is I think what's different about video from the existing digital ads and the, the, the two prominent differences to me are, um, it, first of all, it's just a lot more expensive. Uh, and, and secondly, it's uh, much more um, resource uh, intensive. It, it um, uses more bandwidth and it, it uses more compute power. And, and so on one hand, um, it uh, increases the incentives uh, for potentially creating inefficient exposures to advertising. Uh, on the other hand, it also increases the cost of, of doing so. And, and so to the extent that we have a, a smaller number of video advertising providers, um, which I think is true today, whether it remains true is, is another question. Um, there may be greater ability to, to coordinate and, and standardize the, the terms of, of the video advertising marketplace uh, than, than what we've seen in the display uh, or, or uh, advertising marketplace. Great. I have one more question, and we'll turn to questions from from the chat. Um, and this involves you know, a question around device IDs and cookies being removed. So, you know, they're one of the few things that allow measurement transparency. Um, and I know in the case of Google, they're proposing a federated learning solution, which involves a clean room. Um, and you know, the issue there is you you can buy information on consumers from third parties. I don't know how good the quality is, but you can buy it. Um, now, all of a sudden, you'll have to buy information from Google, who also happens to own the sell side and demand side and the exchange. Does this raise, you know, so what are your perspectives about, you know, the removal of cookies in terms of the efficacy of ad measurement in, in light of not having that third party anymore? Yeah, Carl, in my view, uh, the, the um, removal of cookies without a suitable alternative is a problem um, because what that does is it, it essentially uh, renders the ability to do um, more specific targeting for many, many uh, marketing and media companies uh, impossible. And it puts greater degrees of power into the wall gardens. You, you said something very interesting. When you have the entire supply chain inside your wall garden, in, inside your, your company, so you have, have the data, you have the tracking, you have the supply, and you have the, you know, the demand, then you, you control the demand, then you kind of have a monopoly. So I think <laughs> that is that is going to be important for regulators to take a harder look at, um, to, to identify, you know, uh, whether that really is the, the right solution. In the meantime, there's only, uh, the only way we have been able to figure this out is to start thinking about um, we need to make sure that we get our own data. We need to establish a, a, a relationship with the consumers we serve where they can trust us to be able to get data in a way that, that serves a utility for them. And so that's probably the, the, the thing that we have, have moved toward. And then look for those, um, those other suppliers, the alternatives, that allow us to be able to get much more of a free market exchange, um, which is why we believe programmatic is an important uh, an important part of uh, of this ecosystem. Yeah, I, I don't think there's a lot more to add. I think Mark covered that pretty well. Um, Google monopolizes uh, certain aspects of the advertising delivery function, and uh, we've seen for more than a decade they they have expanded. The, the number of aspects that, that they monopolize. And while we all uh, support the idea of consumer privacy, um, uh, Google is uh, not declining to collect uh, data. It is declining to uh, share data with uh, parties that could uh, use the data responsibly to enable productive economic transactions. And um, the pricing power, the, the uh, lack of transparency, the, the 
potential obfuscations uh, that enables uh, are are deeply concerning in in their potential scale. And and so I think this is the the reason uh, that regulators all over the world are, are moving on this and uh, appropriately so. Um, and uh, it's an open question where where this will shake out, but but it's it's really important for um, marketers to speak up um, so that they have a voice in in this process. Great, thanks both. Um, I'm going to turn again now to the questions in the chat. Um, can we? Is it, is it possible, Matt, to put Victor's mic on? Because Victor's asking a question very much in the spirit of MSI and the Advertising Research Foundation about partnerships between industry and academics to address the kinds of problems that both, you know, Rosie and, and Ken have outlined. So, Victor? I just want to ask um, uh, sometimes uh, to which extent seems in general will personally take part in the research and specifically like for Pamela and Mark, what would motivate you to take part in CMO-focused survey study? Would it be importance of the issue in general, early access to study results, any specific topic, whatever? Thank you. I, I think CMOs um, and, and companies would be interested in, in academic research, particularly academic research that would, would benefit the entire industry. Uh, so you know that that's why for for me it was um, it was uh, easy, an easy decision to to share uh, our views on inefficiencies in digital advertising in this in this academic setting because I feel that it it, it helps everyone. You know, at the end of the day, what we want is a level playing field, and if with a level playing field where we can compete on the basis of innovation and creativity, that will lift all boats. The the current system is is not an efficient system it's a, it's an incredibly inefficient system so you know the degree to which we can then um, assess and 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 do do experiments together and do research in order to help advance the industry uh, we would be very 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 open to doing that thank you Pam I don't know if you're still here because I know you're scheduled earlier but if you are um, I'll give you a moment to jump in no, um, thanks. This is, you know, very critical. And then and, and I, I just want to thank Mark for leading the charge and, and sharing with the industry so much of, of what he's learned and, and championing um, uh, the efforts to, to make our marketing more uh, effective and viable. We, we follow them very closely, and I'm honored just to be in the presence of such greatness, um, both mm. Mark and, and, and these you know, you all who are, are leading the charge and, and really helping us understand the consumer and what, what's going on. And um, it's a great time to be in marketing. I will say so much disruption from when we started back in the day, Mark. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. And we're trying to lead, you know, just to Pam's point, disruption can be uh, destructive. And disruption can actually lead to uh, you know what we call a, you know the asymmetry, where some some win and 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 others or lots lose. What we want to do is have what we call constructive disruption, that actually grows the markets, and that's one of the things that I think from an academic standpoint it would be it would be helpful. In fact, you know just before we got on here, as we were talking about how has the free market economy changed as a result of the digital world, we should really take a hard look at that, and and the, you know that the on the one hand, we've now given access to thousands and millions of companies who, as Pam was saying earlier, can advertise. But on the other hand, we've created other sources where there's been such a consolidation of power, and now the potential for that consolidation of power to be even more, that is going to have an effect on, 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 on economics. And I think we really need to think that through. And I think the academic community being involved in that would be very, very important. It's not just going to be marketers doing this. Pam said it well. We we can boycott. We can stop our spending. It's a drop in the ocean. But if if regulators and legislators are taking a look at it, and if the academic community is taking a look at it, plus the businesses and marketers, I think we can make a, a useful difference that will ultimately help help everyone. And that's really what we'd like to help your help on. Yeah, I wish. Uh... We're getting some great questions now. I wish I had time to add more, but I think you've closed on an absolutely fabulous note in the spirit of this whole project. 
I want to thank every speaker, the organizers, my co-editors, um, and all the you know, nearly 100 people who tuned in this morning to watch this for their interest and engagement in what are some really pressing issues facing marketing today. Um, Matt has put the link again to the special issue. I encourage everybody to take a, a quick look at it. And, and I couldn't be more delighted, again, with everybody and your participation in making something very special happen. Great session. Thank you, Ken, for closing up. Great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Thanks, Carl. Thanks, Carl. Thanks.